Coppola had some concerns, so Member Coppola, you have the floor. Okay. Um, I pulled it out only because we had over the period of time, maybe the summer and just before the end of the school year, people um, who had approached us in regards to they had applied for principal directors and um, we were told that there were no um, applicants that met the criteria. And you know, we had five elementary schools that that would involve. And I just, you know, candidates themselves who said that they passed in their stuff and didn't ever receive a call, you know, saying that, so, you know, we received your application, but um, you're not, you know, in the run for being interviewed. And um, it was just concerning to me because all of these people were within our system they say that they have the qualifications, yet they didn't get an interview. And we had it on our policy, you know, that anybody um, within the system, as well as if they lived in Lynn, mm -hmm. you know, would get an interview. You know, and I know it does say they have to meet the qualifications, but these are people working here that say they meet the qualifications. Um, I, I, I know that it's kind of a confusing write-up of the screening procedure policy, but um, I, I would like it to be maybe cleaned up a little bit and, and actually, um, you know, because we have five interim principals right now, so eventually we are going to reach the point where we're going to be doing you know, another job posting for the principal jobs with interviews. And I, I don't want that to happen again. It's, um, it doesn't help for morale in the school system. And um, I don't know whether it, it just requires that, you know, they, uh, they definitely get an interview, uh, whether somebody thinks they meet it or they don't meet it. I'm not sure. Uh, Member Magnolia. Thank you. So um, I guess my concern is actually chronicled in the title. This, it's called the Screening Procedures Policy. And my understanding of what belongs in our policy manual is not procedures. So it seems to me like what the policy committee needs to do is take the suggestions, MASC has given us a couple of language suggestions for recruiting, posting of vacancies, and hiring, um, that the abiding principle for a policy is an overarching goal, not the minutia of a procedure. Procedures should not be in a policy manual because they can be shifted um, much more easily than I think the last time the entire procedure uh, p policy manual went through was quite a long time ago. So, um, so these this needs to to be in the realm of policy, not in the realm of procedure, um, is my sense. And because MASC has given us some suggested language, I would agree with Member Coppola, um, but it's not going to have twenty steps that say first this, then this, then that, because that's entirely procedural. Um, so I, I understand what Member Coppola is saying, but that would be a separate issue. The policy just should have abiding goals for how we approach screening, promotions. Uh, I mean, if you look at, you know, it's, it's called promotions academic titles. None of this really tracks with what it's trying to do. So I think the whole thing just needs to be started over and... <laughs> It needs to specifically adhere to, again, what a policy should be, an overarching or abiding goal for how we look at hiring. Um, and we can, we can use the MASC language. We can um, put more into that MASC language. But the thing we should not do is make it procedural. Uh, Member Gately. Well, this screen screening procedures policy was revised and approved by the school committee on March 27, 2014. So it was not 
back in 1993 when all the policies were aligned. I can understand where you may com be confused or question the word procedures and have it listed, but in the past, I believe <coughs> that the school committees was having problems with how to go about hiring and what is the right hiring practice for Lynn. So they made this, and I quite frankly like it. I like to know the steps. I like to know that I have, like number nine, the committee chairperson shall extend an invitation to each school committee member to observe each interview and provide school committee members with the interview schedule and information packet on each candidate. I like that. I want to do that. I want to do that about the um, superintendent search. So I, I really don't think we should change this right now. I think we should leave it the way it is. This was made specifically with the issues that Lynn was having, and I don't think those issues have changed. Uh, sorry, Member Castellanos. So, have we? So, I know the MS, MASC, excuse me, MASC has language. Have we? Also, maybe have, have have we had a conversation with our compliance officer yet around this issue? I think maybe we should have. Uh, uh, maybe you know when we talk about there any type of so 327 2014. Right now it's 2022. If we're seeking to do any type of, of a revision, I do recommend that we do we do um, partner with our compliance officer and just maybe see what revisions are needed, what are necessary, what, what, what kind of tweaks or updates for the, scre the screening procedure policy, if we have to modify the name or whatever. There's, t there's 20 different steps. Um, see, what's, see what's viable, see what's not. Um, maybe have a, a deeper, robust um, collaboration with, with the committee chairperson. I like number nine. I like, actually, I, I like that. I like that piece to uh, stay. Um, but also, in terms of just what the procedures are and how we label it, I think it's important to make sure that I think we do need to ensure our compliance officer is, is there on the forefront. That's just my thoughts. And the administration maybe organize how we want to attack that because that is important, especially when it comes to um, you know promotions and being able to. Uh, for me, you have five different elementary schools, and if folks, you know, if we have to have a process that's transparent and equitable, and offer that, and have a process that's actually effective for us internally. Um, and also, uh, there's 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 the the compliance piece too. So I think there's certain there's certain protocols that we already have in place. Figure out you know where could we improve and pick apart you know uh, 2014 to now. It's the the educational environment has changed a bit. So I think it would be important to as we we have this discussion um, to really start to add the right people to the table. <clears throat> All right, I guess um, seeing no more comments or does anybody else have anything they want to add to the discussion? Okay, so what I'm hearing is that uh, we need to take this back to the policy subcommittee talk to attorney Gallo our compliance officer have him take a look at it um, and member Coppola's concerns about uh, just making sure that this is followed closer when we um, do make hires I think is going to be important as well uh, member Magnolia yes yeah so one concern that I, I have that has to be reflected is that this does not specify other than saying for principles we'll do this specific this, this is a blanket policy for every single person in the entirety of Lynn Public Schools, which means if the folks who like it now, we would be out of compliance with our own policy every single time someone is hired if we don't do all 20 steps. And that to me is deeply problematic. So I, I respect what Member Gately is, is saying, but I'm going to respectfully disagree that this doesn't 
set us up for failure because it doesn't specify the level at which the school committee is supposed to be involved. Now, if we're talking about supervisory roles or if we're talking about at the level of administrators only, um, that's a different type of policy than one that's just a blanket LPS policy. And as I read through this, it does specify some procedures for folks who are in certain categories, but it doesn't say that this applies only to them. It applies to all hiring. And that to me <clears throat> is setting us up in a, a, a way that um, we would be out of compliance with our own policy uh, every time we, we hire anyone and don't follow these 20 procedures. Um, so I, I think we have to both look at our compliance officer, but also craft a policy that can reasonably be carried out all the time. Um, I'm going to speak for myself as somebody with a full-time job, a family, and yes, a tremendous dedication to this school committee, but I do not want to be on the hiring committees for the hundred people that we uh, you know, hired recently. <laughs> so um, I, I want to make sure this is scalable again, for Lynn, for the place we find ourselves. Member Gately. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Member Coppola, but in March 27, 2014, wasn't um, Gallo on the school committee? Uh, yeah, I think he was. He was on time. the school committee. So he will be able to clarify all your issues, um, Mrs. Magnolia, or Dr. Magnolia. So I think that we need, you need as a subcommittee to go and talk with him. He'll explain the background of it. You'll have a better understanding. I understand your concerns that we could be breaking the policy, <coughs> but there was a reason it was put in this way and there was a reason that it was step by step and I think you need to clarify that before you move on. Thank you. Oh, Superintendent Rogero, sorry. I just, yeah. I just want clarification. Um, it talks about academic titles. Yeah. Uh, ed reform, so school-based administrators with ed reform principals <coughs> do those hires. They do do committees within the building, but there's number two asks for, um, I'm sorry, number three asks for the approval of school committee um, to approve the position. Is that every position? That, so that's a question for me. What does academic titles mean? Is it executive director, district level administrators, principals, or is it all ad administrator position? Like, I, I need to know. I, listen, I will say, I will say, as someone who went through mm -hmm a hiring committee for various jobs throughout my career, I 100% agree that we need the committees. We just did a, uh, the execu executive director of SEL, we had a committee. Mm -hmm. We had two, you know, two school committee members on that committee. Uh, we're doing other positions, we're doing other interviews uh, that are coming up. I have created a committee. Um, but it's, it's, it clearly says in here less than five. I don't need to have a whole committee, but I'm doing a committee. So I don't want to break the rules. I don't want, I want to make sure that anyone from Lynn Public Schools or the city of Lynn has a right to interview. I agree with that. But the way this is written, it is confusing. Uh, Mayor Nicholson and then Member Coppola. Uh, thank you. So um, I think uh, obviously a, a lot of questions here and some some uh, great work for the, the policy subcommittee to, to do. I just I, I feel like it's helpful context that um, we had discussed this a few weeks ago uh, and uh, you know this issue and uh, Ms. Presser, who we've retained from MASC to, to advise us on the overhauling of the uh, policy manual has had advised us that there are some issues with ed reform, uh, some conflicts with the policy. And as, as, as we all know, that in a conflict between a school committee policy and the, and the state education law, 
the state education law governs. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I do, I do think we should be really careful about that. I mean, the good news is, is that we have retained uh, Ms. Presser to advise us on this, and we've been working our way through the, the process of updating all the policies um, into best practice and, you know, making those edits as we see fit from the uh, proposed policies from the MASC. So I, it, it does seem like that's uh, what we need to do here. Um, the, you know, the other issue we identified working through the policies, you all recall, is that there were some issues with the with the records themselves in terms of what was approved and when it was approved um, that created some of the problems. And so I think uh, we've made a, a lot of progress in cleaning up those sections we, we, we've addressed. And this is obviously a section that needs to be addressed as well. And Member Coppola. Um, I, I see exactly what Superintendent Ruggiero was saying. And even when I looked at it, um, I knew there were things in there that it don't apply to us. I mean, the hiring of teachers or uh, anybody within the school building. That that isn't what I think. I, what I think when these things were added on, they were meant for uh, maybe administrative right. jobs from principals up. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think that's um, you know where the policy should go. And you know a lot of this should be eliminated and and changed. Um, but you know somewhere. I wouldn't want that to get lost, you know, as far as um, having screening committees be because I think that um, we're a really large system and I think people um, should have that opportunity to be able to do that. And as well as people who live in our community, you know, who would like to be invested in the school system and have a chance at an interview. So um, I definitely think there's a number of things here that we're, we are out of sync with and like to see it just taken back and worked on. Right. Okay, so seeing no further comment. Um, concerns, Member Magnolia? I move to adjourn. Okay, second. Roll call. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Okay, adjourned. <clears throat>
Last call for open mic. Seeing nobody, we conclude the open mic session. Thank you.
Twenty-five, one fifty-three. Ready? I'd like to call to order the seventeenth regular meeting of the school committee. Roll call, please. Member Castellanos. Present. Member Capola. Present. Member Dugan. Present. Member Gately. Present. Member Magnolia. Present. Member Pena. Present. Mayor Nicholson. Present. Don't please rise for a salute to the flag, followed by a moment of silence. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing as we recognize in memoriam Robert Bruce Terrison, a former teacher, who passed away October 6, 2022. Thank you. First item in the minutes. Make a motion to accept the Buildings and Grounds Subcommittee meeting on October 27, 2022, and accept the minutes of the meeting for the 16th regular meeting on October 27, 2022. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Appointments. Well, so I am so pleased to announce the appointment of Tina Hufnagel as the Executive Director of Social Emotional Learning. Tina has been a clinician in the district for 20 years. Beginning her career at the Welcome Elementary School in 2002, she then went on to service the Cobbett Learning Community for multiple years until she entered a district level position in 2016 as a program specialist for parent and family engagement. She transitioned to assistant director of SEL in 2019. In all of her roles, Tina has been an integral member of the LPS team in, in creating the vision, developing the model, and supporting the learning in her SEL work. Tina Hofnagel is clinically accomplished and a well-respected social worker who will lead the SEL department with incredible commitment and expertise. And I just want to note that the committee that interviewed, it was 11 to 0 that she was the one. And uh, we asked her to come back down for a follow-up question, and she got a standing ovation when she walked in. So we are very thrilled to have her a permanent member of our team. Thank you all so much. Um, those are really amazing words. Um, you, you can sit just so then you can talk in the microphone, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm really honored uh, to have this appointment and uh, to sit here tonight and to just uh, thank each one of you. Um, I really uh, trust and hope that I will serve well this amazing district that has served me in my career as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to um, continuing the work that we've started as a uh, district, as a clinical team, and I look forward to the opportunity to bring um, SEL practices forward uh, K-12 to and support the emotional and social and uh, mental health learning for our um, students. So I thank you all, and I'm quite humbled by thank this you. opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. All right, next item is the MCAS access update from the superintendent. And here we go. <laughs> uh, tonight I'll be sharing our 2022 access MCAS data. I feel I need to be upfront right from the start that what is going to be shared tonight will not make us feel good. Mm. It will be disappointing, disheartening, and will cause concern for all of us. At the same time, we need to understand that there can't be finger pointing as to what is at the root of this data. There has been a bigger impact here, the pandemic being a big part of it. Many districts are seeing how the pandemic has impacted student performance and growth, and we are no different. Our students must be our priority. We as a community need to rally to elevate our students' needs ahead of our own. The 2022 accountability data, this is the first release of accountability information since 2019. Under federal regulations, flexibility was granted for one year. The Department of Education reported less accountability data than usual. 
This year's information includes data on all accountability indicators and school percentiles. It does not include targets for those indicators or measures of progress towards targets. And uh, the 2022 data will be considered as a new baseline moving forward. I don't know if you remember years back, we had started with a baseline and then the uh, targets and accountability went from there. The Department of Ed has made a decision that this will be a new baseline. And target setting will resume next year, 2023. I want to note here that LPS has not had a typical testing year since 2018. If you remember 2019, we had the technology issues, so that impacted our testing. 2020, there was no testing because of COVID. 2021, students returned to in-person just in time for MCAS testing. Uh, the last two and a half school years have not been normal, so the results are going to be different. Spring of 2023 should be a typical testing and accountability year. I wanted to start just by kind of uh, grounding us in who our students are and what populations uh, we serve. Um, and so it's important for us to remind ourselves on who our students are. During uh, the school year 2021-22, our district had 15,727 students in our enrollment. Out of this enrollment, 69.1% of our students are Hispanic, which equals about 10,867 students. 64.2% of our students' first language is not English, and that's also about 10,096 students, with 36.3% of our students are English language learners, which was about 5,700 students. 76.3 are economically disadvantaged, which is about 12,000 students. And 85.8 of our students are considered high needs, and that's about 13,493 students. And just to give you an update on this year's enrollment, I found out today, thanks to Rania, um, we just hit 6,500 L's in our district, which is now 39.3% of our enrollment are considered L's. In K-3, to we're at 65% of the students are L's. And in K to four, 61 percent. So I think we really need to think about who we're serving and how we're serving them. This slide is a slide that actually was, it's a Department of Education slide. It was part of the urban superintendent presentation as well as the presentation that was done for all superintendents. Um, student and basically they were reporting out the student absenteeism uh, remaining to be a challenge um, for recovery efforts. Students have attended less school over the past several years. Statewide, the average student missed 11 days in 2021 and 15 days in 2022. 18% of all students missed 10% of school days in 2021 and 28% missed 10% of school in 2022. Chronic absenteeism for students in grades three to eight increased uh, in 2022 by 138% in the state. 41,000 versus 98,000 students as compared uh, to 2019. 39% of students in urban school districts missed 10% of school days in 2022. 1.7 million days of missed school because of positive COVID-19 cases in 2022. So this slide represents that statewide chronic absenteeism data and state data shows that urban districts were adversely impacted by COVID as noted by the 39% of students in these districts uh, missing 10% or more days in 2022. So what does that mean for Lynn? Let's put it in perspective. If each case, so this, this chart represents the number of cases for students and staff that we had in school year 21-22. Uh, for students, we had 3,254 cases, and for staff, 990, uh, 966 cases, for a total of 4,220. Uh, 
If each case represents one person, then that is the 4,220 cases out of an estimated population of 18,000 teachers and students. This means 22% of our population was potentially absent for five to 10 days at a time, at, at, um, at a time due to positive COVID cases. That represents a potential of 42,200 COVID sick days, which does not include the number of absences due to potential exposure to the virus, like close contact that had to stay home. And it also doesn't include the typical absences. Remember that these are just COVID related absences um, and the impact <coughs> of this is quite astonishing. This is our chronic absenteeism, uh, the historical data for it from 2011 right up to 2022. The percentage of students missing 10% or more of their days enrolled. The chronic absenteeism rate includes both excused and unexcused absences and is calculated for students in grades pre-K to 12. This slide is here deliberately uh, to highlight the profound impact on LPS. By 2020, we had made strides in reducing this rate, but the return of in-person learning in 2021 was greatly impacted, um, has greatly impacted absenteeism. Chronic absenteeism here represents excused and unexcused absences. 42.1% represent that almost half of our students were chronically absent during 21-22. Heading into COVID, we were seeing a three-year downward trend in our chronically absent rate. The COVID cases directly impacted this pro progress and as a result, our students' progress. I also wanted to note uh, the way our testing was administered over the past four years. Um, 2019 was an abnormal year due to the technology <coughs> issues, so that testing, um, we did do a full test administration, but the testing was paper. In 2022, I mean in 2020, it was a uh, full test administered for access, but no testing administered for MCAS. In 2021, Access testing was remote instruction, in-person testing though. We brought our L's in to do access testing during that year. Uh, for MCAST, it was remote instruction and half uh, test administered in person for three to eight and full test administered for grade 10. And in 2022, access was full test administered and so was at uh, MCAS in both uh, grade spans. Okay, overall school accountability percentile. An accountability percentile between one and 99 is reported for most schools. The number is an indication of the school's overall performance relative to other schools that serve similar grades and is calculated using multiple years of data for all accountability indicators. School per percentiles are not calculated for districts. Please note that on this slide, there are two schools uh, that are not shown here because they have fewer than 20 students who participated in testing and the state does not report on that. This data shows that we have five schools below the 10th percentile. These five schools will receive targeted support both from the district and from the state. As a reminder, this year will be a baseline year going forward, and per the Department of Ed, no additional schools will be placed in turnaround status. Prior to COVID, many of our LPS schools were making great progress and gains in raising student achievement. COVID impacted everyone. District-wide, we can see the impact of COVID. So let's look at ELA specifically. 
ELA scores in both LPS and the state level continued to decline in 2022. The state has noted that the biggest decline was in grades three to five in ELA, and the question remains, is the decline <coughs> over? This slide represents the three-year change of percent of students meeting or exceeding expectations. As you can see in ELA, both the state and Lynn Public Schools have seen a decrease in the number of students who are meeting or exceeding expectations across all grade bands since 2019. The range for each proficiency level is on the bottom right of this slide for your review. This graph represents an overview of the percent of students at each achievement level in ELA on the 2022 MCAS. Of note, grade 10 has 31% of students meeting expectations and 2% of students exceeding expectations. In the elementary grade band, we see fewer than 20% of our students meeting or exceeding expectations. These results demonstrate our new baseline and show the gravity of COVID's impact. Thus, we're choosing to focus strategically and intentionally on our students' critical needs. We must afford our students new opportunities to lean into systems and supports. You will see examples of our key actions later in this presentation. This slide represents the number of students in each school who are meeting or exceeding expectations in ELA with the orange bars representing 2019 and the blue bars representing 2020. Wow. As you can see, the names of the schools have intentionally been detected, de uh, redacted in an effort to demonstrate an overall decline across all schools in our district. Here tonight, our focus is not to single out any one school, but rather to shift our efforts to a collective improvement across all schools. This overall decline further emphasizes the need to be more strategic about, about how we engage our students. This slide is hard to look at. I have to be honest, I've not slept all week. This has not been easy. This data hits home for all of us. There is no question that we have a lot of work to do here. Our lower grade levels showed a much greater de decrease in performance than the high school grades. Even our highest performing schools were not immune to the impact of COVID on learning. Here you can see the ELA student growth percentiles, or SGP, comparing 2019 to 2022. Student gr growth percentiles provide a measure of the degree to which a student's achievement has changed from the prior year to the current year <coughs> in comparison to other students in the same grade who performed similarly in the past. <coughs> Typically, student growth percentiles fall between 40 and 59 percent. The majority of our schools fell within that range. Additionally, seven of our schools saw an increase in their student growth percentiles. The uh, ELA yearly comparisons by demographics and select populations. This graph shows the percentage of students meeting and exceeding expectations by subgroup with 2019 in orange and 21 in yellow and 22 in blue. In 2019, in grades three to eight, 38% 38 of all students met or exceeded expectations compared to 8% of students with disabilities and 12% of our Ls. Similarly, in grade 10, 37% of all students in 2019 met or exceeded expectations compared to 7% of students with disabilities and 1% of Ls. It's important to note that while our Ls are at 12% in 2019 for grades three to eight, our former Ls, 
so students who tested out and are now former L's, are 42 percent, which is a significant number of students who met or exceeded expectations. Similarly, in grade 10, our L's are at 1 percent, while our former L's rise to 21 percent. We see the same pattern in 21 and 22. What this data shows is that our former L's are achieving, while also highlighting our need to focus on our most marginalized students, L's and students with disabilities. Another point is the continuation of our students of color, African American and Hispanic populations, not achieving at the same rate as their peers. Clearly, we have a lot of work to do in this area, and while we have begun our hope and healing work, there is still plenty to do to address this clear difference in performance. The Commissioner's District for 2022 ELA MCAS, this is a variation of a scatter plot which compares student growth percentile to the average scaled scores. Here the data points are replaced with bubbles. Uh, and the size of the bubbles represent the relative size of the data point. In this case, each bubble represents one of the commissioner's districts in grades three to eight for ELA. Notice Lynn in yellow. As you can see, Lynn is situated towards the middle of the commissioner's district. Ideally, we would want to see both high student gr growth and high average scaled scores, putting us in the upper right corner of this graph. Again, there is work to be done to move us closer to the state. Here is grade 10's uh, ELA comparison, the same um, graph for grade 10. Lynn in yellow, again, falls towards the middle of the commissioner's district. Now let's look at math. <coughs> this slide represents the three-year change of percent of students meeting or exceeding expectations in math. As you can see, Lynn Public Schools is on trend with the state in terms of the numbers of students who are meeting or exceeding expectations. The green highlight signifies that math scores in grades three to eight show the beginning of recovery in, uh, in 2022. Similar to ELA, this graph contains an overview of the percent of students at each achievement level in math on the 2022 MCAS. At every grade level, fewer than 20% of students are meeting or exceeding expectations. Again, as we saw in ELA, there is an urgency to respond to the needs of our students. Mm -hmm. The next slide contains the percentage of students in each school who are meeting or exceeding expectations in math with the orange bars representing 2019 and the blue representing 2022. <coughs> and like ELA, there has been a significant decline in the percentage of students who are meeting or exceeding expectations across all schools. These drops are consistent with the data that we have looked at so far and correlated with disruptions connected to COVID. Here is the, sure. Can I just, I, just a clarify question or? Yeah, just, okay. just gonna be quick, not really to stop your presentation. Are we gonna be able to see um, schools. the schools and uh, uh, eventually like some, some documentation so we can see the schools so I afterwards? Did, I did provide you with a document that shares who the schools are by number. Sorry. So that you, okay. you have that information. Thank you. Here you can see the math student gr growth percentiles comparing uh, 2019 to 2022 and as a reminder the uh, student growth falls between 40 and 59. We had 19 schools fell within that range in 2022. Here is math's yearly comparison by demographic and selected populations. This graph shows the percent of students exceeding and meeting expectations by subgroup. Again, with 2019 in orange, uh, 2021 in yellow, 2022 in blue. 
For example, in 2019, in grades three to eight, 38 percent of students exceeded or met expectations compared to 11 percent of students with disabilities and 15 percent of ELLs. Similarly, in grade 10, 38 percent of all students in 19 exceeded uh, or met expectations compared to 10 percent of students with disabilities and 4 percent of ELLs. It's important to note that while our L's are at 15% in 2019 for grades three to eight, the former L's, again, uh, were higher at 41%, which is a significant number of students who met or exceeded expectations. And similarly, in grade 10, we saw the same thing, 4% um, for L's, while former L's rose to 38%. We see the same pattern uh, for 21 and 22, and like ELA, this data shows that our former L's are achieving while also highlighting our need to focus on our most marginalized students, the L's and students with disabilities. <coughs> and here is the uh, commissioner's district uh, math uh, scatter plot uh, comparing student growth percentile to average scale scores. Uh, for grades three to eight in math, and you can see that Lynn is highlighted in yellow here. Uh, Lynn's placement on this graph illustrates the work to be done in our district. And again, ideally, we would want to see uh, both the student growth and the hi uh, high average scaled score putting us in that upper right-hand corner of the graph. And then here is uh, grade 10, the same graph, and you can see Lynn is not in a good place. And so let's now look at science. Again, this is, represents the three-year change um, of percent of students meeting <laughs> or exceeding uh, for grades five, eight, and high school bio biology MCAS for uh, 2019 to 2022. We will start by looking at the grade five and eight uh, science, technology, and engineering MCAS results. As you can see in the final column of this data tab uh, table, the percentage of students meeting or exceeding expectations on the grade five and eight science ma uh, MCAS have decreased significantly from 2019 to 2022. However, a positive change in scores from 21 to 20, uh, 2022 at an increase greater than that of the state, showing the beginning of recovery <coughs> here. Mm -hmm. Please note that 2022 was the first administration of the next generation MCAS high school biology and physics testing. Next generation and legacy MCAS scores are not comparable. Uh, and is also important to note that the 2022 high school biology results reflect a combination of scores of students who took the June 2021 legacy test and students who took the February 2022 legacy test and some students who took the June 2022 next generation test. So it's a combination of all three. Mm -hmm. Here is the science MCAS results by achievement level. Um, it, you know, it shares the 2022 science MCAS tests and how our students achieved um, at each grade level. This slide contains the percentage of students in each school who are meeting and exceeding in science with the orange bars 2019 blue to 2020. Remember that 2022 was the first administration of the next generation uh, high school biology testing and next generation and legacy is not comparable. And you can see a big difference there. And here are the subgroups. Um, it's showing, you know, percentage of students exceeding by subgroup. For example, uh, in 2020, uh, 2019, to, uh, in grades five and eight, 41 percent of students exceeded or met expectations compared to 25 percent of students with disabilities and eight percent of L's. It's important to note that while the eight percent of L's in grades five to eight exceeded uh, or met expectations in 2019, 37 percent of former L's exceeded or met. 
And we see again the similar patterns in 2021 and 2022. Uh, what this data shows again is that our former L's are achieving um, while also highlighting the need to focus on the other two groups. Since 2022, the first administration of next uh, generation MCAS high school biology testing, 2019 and 2021, scores can't be compared, so you're only seeing um, 2022. And here you can see Lynn compared to uh, the commissioner's district. Uh, the, bar, the bar graph compares the 2022 grades five and eight average scale scores to the commissioner's districts. And of the commissioner's district, Lynn uh, is outperformed only by New Bedford. Mm -hmm. And here is grade 10. Uh, Lynn is in the middle of the pack. There is work to be done to move us up in this group. <clears throat> this uh, chart represents the change in MCAS average scale score from 2019 to 2022. Uh, clearly shows that all grade levels have had a decrease in the average scale score in ELA, math, and science, with the largest decreases in the younger grades. This is consistent with the state's analysis of MCAS across the state. And this chart is showing the uh, MCAS growth in ELA and math by grade. Student growth percentile is only provided for <coughs> students who have tested two or more years. And as you can see, our L's and students with disabilities subgroups are showing less growth than all student subgroup in both ELA and math. LPS making English language proficiency progress four year trend. Although 2020 was a COVID year for MCAS with no MCAS testing conducted, access testing had been uh, completed during co the COVID <coughs> shutdown. In 2021, almost all students were being taught remotely and L's had to come in on access testing days to take the access test. After a dip in 2021, making progress uh, towards English language proficiency, all grade spans showed growth in 2022 as they approached the 2022 levels. Our 2022 data shows an increase. However, we are still behind where our students' progress was in 2019. And here, uh, shows our historical four-year graduation rate. Um, graduation rates are at a 12-year high. This is an area we have been making some progress in since 2010. It would be important to note that graduation requirements were adjusted in 2020 and 2021 with the CD completion. Students need to pass the ELA, math, and science uh, class rather than pass the MCAS test. That was what the adjustment was. They just had to pass a class and not pass the test. We will need to monitor this data going forward because we're going back to that they need to pass the test. And this uh, chart or uh, graph shows historical graduation rates. Um, um, oh no, historical dropout rate, sorry, um, over from 2010 to 2021. Dropout rates are at a 12 year low. Uh, the dropout rate is another area that our high schools have put a great deal of effort in through their work with the Mass Grad Grant. We continue to lower this data, but need to continue to work on addressing the number of L's who are dropping out as they make up much of the students who are dropping out. So to give just some data highlights um, after that, um, in science in grades five and eight, there was a slight bounce back on scaled scores from 2021 to 2022. This was a bigger increase than the state. 
Former L's in grades 5, 8, and 10 performed at least as well as the all-student group for scaled score averages. In ELA, LPS shows signs of rebounding in grades 3 to 8 and grade 10 at a greater rate than the state is. Starting with uh, grade 6, LPS steadily increased the percentage of students in the meeting and exceeding uh, proficiency levels while decreasing the percentage of not meeting expectations. <coughs> Former L's in grades 3 to 8 and 10 performed at least as well as the all student um, group for scaled score averages. And at the high school level, the Hispanic Latino demographic groups closed the achievement gap with the all student group. And in math, in grades three to eight, with uh, the students with disability group and the L group, along with all the demographic groups noted in this presentation, stayed at least the same as 2021, and in most cases improved in the percentage of student uh, at the meeting and exceeding proficiency levels. And former L's in grades five, eight, and 10 performed at least as well as the all student group for scaled score averages. And finally, looking at all grades and student growth percentiles, the uh, English learner group was nearly identical to all student group. Oh, sorry, not finally. <laughs> And then the um, English learners making progress after a dip in 2021, making progress towards English language proficiency, all grade spans showed growth in 2022 as they approached the, 20, um, the 2020 levels. Uh, graduation rates were at a 12 year high and dropout rates were at a 12 year low. So our data clearly shows that the pandemic has impacted our students and that they are performing and their performance greatly we have a lot of work to do we now still share the key action we will now share the key actions that we're taking during the 22 23 school year we are focusing in on three areas strengthen district-wide social emotional supports uh, lps strategic plan focus and the academic enrichment and supports <coughs> so strengthen district-wide social emotional supports we all know that uh, we have implemented the new clinical model almost 400 percent increase of school-based clinicians this includes 65 clinicians and 23 clinical supervisors we have the addition of a second assistant director of social emotional learning we built capacity of the clinical team via clinical supervision, professional development, and accountability. We promote student sense of belonging via SEL practices. We're utilizing the CASEL indicators of school-wide um, social-emotional learning work. And we continue to implement the Caring Schools community in K-5. to <coughs> Key action two. This represents, so this is where this document that I gave to you, the laminated card, this represents the work being done across schools and across all educator levels. This work stems from compiling information and listening to the voices of our building leaders and our staff. We work together with our school leaders to align our work from the district down to the classroom level with consistent systems that include the voices of staff who are doing the work. With that collective focus, we heard their voice by conducting a list sort label activity and created this one page document, which we provided a copy of on our collective focus for the school year 22-23. We wanted to make sure we were all moving in the same direction in regards to our stated objectives and outcomes of our district st uh, strategic plan. We have taken the data from the list sort label and zeroed in on three focus areas to guide our work, leveraging our current work and building capacity in other areas. The three focus areas are professional learning, data analysis, and curriculum and instruction. In each focus area, our explicitly named prioritized 
practices that will be implemented at the principal director level and at the elementary and secondary level. Part of acceleration, as we have seen, is to implement prioritized practices. In order to do that, we must be on the same page on what is prioritized. Of course, these practices are not the only things happening um, school in, uh, in the school or district, but as a group, we will uh, be consistent about these focus areas and practices in relation to our goal of the entire school year. These focus areas and prioritized practices are explicitly connected to our strategic objective of supporting students and educators to reach their fullest potential. We are going to provide you with a more detailed presentation on these systems and focus areas at our next meeting. So we will go more in detail around the work that's happening across the district with this. And then our key, a third key action, um, academic enrichment and supports. We are currently working with our schools to set up additional after school learning opportunities to help our students regain the lost learning experienced over the past couple of years. As you are aware, we have also begun implementing multiple curriculum resources in multiple content areas, as well as implemented new ELA courses in the high school level for our students, which is certainly not easy for our teachers but necessary in order to provide our students with high quality curriculum resources that can support the teaching of the Massachusetts standards we are required to teach and to help our students master. None of this is easy, but is necessary in order to help our students move forward. So this is our last slide. And I wanted to return to it. It's the first slide. It's the students. So I wanted to return back to where I started, where I began. And I know that I'm not feeling good right now after speaking about the ways our students have lost ground in their learning and growth. It is truly hard to think about. We need to look at our students' faces and see our duty as adults and as educators to serve them in the journey of regaining their education. Our students need us more now than ever before. The field of education has always been difficult, but it's even more difficult now. We as a collective community need to rally around our students, help them regain the traction that they lost as a result of the pandemic. This is what education is about and we owe it to them for their future and for ours. The educators in the Lynn Public Schools have always worked hard for our students, and I have no doubt that they will do, sorry, I'm getting emotional, sorry, that they will do what needs to get done to move our students forward. It is going to take time, but, but time cannot be wasted uh, in this work. We have begun to put systems in place to help align our work across all levels and to give our educators a voice in the process. We have added new high quality curriculum resources to help address the academic losses and we will continue to look for other ways and materials that we can add so that we can help our students regain what they have lost. Whew. That's heavy. But I will take whatever, we will take whatever questions you ha might have. Thank you. Thank you. Summer Dugan, do you want to make a cue here or just start with Member Dugan? Yeah, I was going to yeah. see if anyone else. Oh, no, yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess I just want to start with uh, thank you. I know that was probably not easy for you. Uh, it wasn't easy, I'm sure, for any of us to see either. Um, being an educator myself and looking at scores of my own students, um, you know, it's tough. It's hard to do. So I, I kind of get a double dose of it, which isn't exactly fun. But um, I guess, you know, um, my main concern would be um, you, you talked about the DESE turnaround status. Um, you know, that keeps coming around in my head and, and making sure we're good there. Is there any um, update on when that might continue or when they might 
you know, start thinking about mm -hmm. stepping in and and because obviously with our scores, this that, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. you yes, know, um, it's a concern for me as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say that um, when the state presented uh, specifically to the urban super uh, superintendents, they did. A totally separate, the same presentation, but it was specialized for the urbans because they were acknowledging that it was much more impactful for the urban districts than um, many of the other districts. It impacted everyone, but it significantly impacted the urbans. Um, and although I want to say to you, I felt like they were saying they're going, they're they're not going to come down with a hammer, you know, right away. Um, the fact that they're saying baseline is it was good that made us feel good that you know we're starting from a starting point now and we need to work from there. Um, but being in education for 37 years and knowing how the Department of Ed works. Um, I have to imagine that accountability will come back. I hope it doesn't come back immediately. I hope they give districts time to really get the momentum and get things going before they start bringing the hammer down. Um, but know that this collective group is committed to helping all of our schools um, to not have that happen. Right. Yeah, and I have no doubt of that. That wasn't what my question was. It's just no. I, I wish yeah. I could say yeah. that yeah. It, it's not going to happen, right. but um, I, I think inevitably it will. It's just a matter of when. Yeah, I think especially, you know, at our elementary schools too, you can see that, you know, it wasn't ideal for students to learn uh, the way they did during yeah. the pandemic, and you know, I think that's reflective in all the numbers. So I, I do hope Desi considers that. So thank you for your answer. Thank you. Um, this was really bad. So um, some of the questions I wrote down as we went through this and some of the questions I wrote down, um, some reason I didn't see the um, email that was sent out and I briefly caught a glimpse of it so I didn't write my questions. So um, one of my concerns is what are you doing for our students with disabilities? Like, especially in certain schools, I won't name them because you don't want me to, but we should be transparent here. But that was one of the concerns. Um, I wondered if we were counting absences. Last year, we didn't have a, um, like, if you were out so long, you know, we used to have, like, if you were absent four times in a quarter, we would have, you, you would end up failing. So I, I don't know if we're doing that to make um, students more accountable. Um, I would love to see this new baseline include community schools for our, really all of the schools that are in danger, which is a large portion of our elementary schools and um, middle schools and our high schools. I'm very worried about our high schools because if they put in that you have to pass the MCAS to graduate, We're, we will not be a positive. Um, I'm very concerned with our students with disability and transparency. Uh, and I just like, what are you going to do for the high school L's at that particular schools that was cited for not doing well with L's? Um, what are you doing for students with the disabilities? Just keeps going through my head. Um, and. That's what I'd like to know. Have you considered community schools? If so, have you spoke to principals that are doing well? What are they doing? What are teachers and principals doing that we may model in our district because they're doing things well? There's a school on here that's doing well. Um, and that's pretty sad to say a school on here doing well. I agree. So those are my questions. So to, there was a lot of questions. I know it's once. like keeps going on, but it always goes back. So with students let with me disabilities. start with the students with disabilities because I, you know, I am 
special ed certified. I taught <coughs> special ed for a number of years, uh, so it, it does mean a lot to me. I am a strong advocate for inclusion and um, them being a <coughs> main part of the building, like not separate, like it, they're, they're yep. part of our um, schools and the fabric of our schools. Um, all of the curriculum that we use, the curriculum resources that we use, there is always special education um, administrators, people from the ed uh, special education office, teachers from uh, schools who are special educators are part of the process because we always want to make sure that the resources that we are purchasing and that we are uh, vetting meet the needs of our students with disabilities. That being said, there's still a lot of work to do around um, how we are servicing our students with disabilities and how uh, the rigor in which we are um, instructing them, the expectations. Um, you know, it's, it's, not in, it's not easy to teach um, in special education, but many of our teachers are very, very good instructors and I think you, you're right we need to tap into our strongest instructors in special education and and hear from them what are you specifically doing that is getting the progress that you have last year I took the time and I mean I took time and I wrote a survey and I surveyed all the staff and I got 81 pages of responses, and I gave it to Dr. Tutwiler, and a lot of these concerns showed up, but nothing was done. So it sort of like makes people think that our voices won't be heard. We spoke up, nothing happened, and then we get these test results. So that's why it's like, I wanna know, what are you changing? What are you doing? right now because these scores have to change right now i, and I know debbie this was dropped in your lap but mm -hmm. but i i do want to i i do want to say th that those absences that i went over at the beginning of the presentation if if students were out because of covid it was five to 10 days. Mm -hmm. If a teacher was out, it was five to 10 days. That's, that's lost learning right there. And it's hard to get that back. Um, so, and I'm not making excuses, please know that. I, I think I was pretty passionate in this, yep. that we owe it to those children, to every, every, every graph we look at, every chart we look at, every data point we look at is a child. Right. And so we owe it to them to make a difference for them. Um, so, and I, I uh, firmly believe that and, and are committed to that. Um, but I don't want it to be felt that our teachers didn't do enough or didn't, like the, the scores are because of what we didn't do. These scores are a result of two and a half years of interrupted I education. I, I don't think it's the teachers that aren't. So I, I no, guess. I, I'm not saying that you're saying that, but I just want to make sure that we're all, you know, understanding that COVID, the impact of COVID is, was immense. And, and every superintendent, I was in a superintendent meeting today, everyone is talking about it, everyone. We're all heartbroken over what, that illness did in education. Thank you. Member Cassiano, said Member Pena, and then Member Capola. Superintendent uh, Ruggiero, thank you for, so much for, for taking us through that uh, presentation. I know it's a lot, it's, it's very emotional. Um, you know, I was here, I was here in the trenches, and it was very traumatizing for the staff, the children, a lot of us that were here to witness all of it. Um, I do appreciate the transparency and the forwardness and the advocacy with everyone involved uh, with trying to hit the pivot. Um, this isn't a surprise. I think we were anticipating a, a significant blow in, in, in this data. Um, I, and I, I do see the baseline as an opportunity as well. 
Um, I think we did increase capacity in our L department and our SEL as well. Um, so as we start to get into to these transition points, uh, we are in transition. We have the, the pandemic. We're we're still recovering. We're still in, like we're still coming out of a crisis. Um, and and I, I do I do believe in the folks at the table um, are committed. Um, and it's 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 very uh, it is alarming. Um, but it is so important to, to remain poised and continue the progress with the I, I really appreciate the the key actions that you put on the table um, these are th this isn't something that this was just strong this was planned out and I understand the the patience that is needed and and also the the reality is is that we are coming from behind already mm -hmm. so when the pandemic hit a district that was already to the floor we were at a disadvantage the pivots have happened i believe in folks here i believe in people at this table uh, and, and i and i'm not going to go through the data and start to chip away and say this is what it is and i i, I do i see that we have a plan and I see that we're we're we're, we're narrowing our focus, and 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 I I, I just I just hope I, I hope and I pray for those children. Like you said, I pray for those children. I pay, I pray for the leaders at the table. I pray for everyone in the city. Uh, when we see the the dropout rates and the, you you look at the end of that sheet, there's positivity there. But now the the awakening, as Member Gately just pointed out, like now they're gonna start holding us to the fire again with MCAS uh, tested. You know. Expect those hikes. We're gonna we're gonna fill that, um, and I think that's something too that I know we're we're preparing for. It's it's just it's a reality that we're in. I'm proud of the moves that we're making with the Student Opportunity Act and and the resources that are coming to the table. I think we have to really be cautious in, in how we set our our goals, and I know we have uh, a strategic a strategic plan that we are implementing. Um, just put in the forecast we're, we're, that's going to be revised we, we need to hit pivots and I think right now we need to capture what we're going to do the next year two three four five years from now I, I'm not going to start attacking the I, I had questions I'm not going to go into it I actually want to highlight the think the, the some of the highlights RL capacity it's glad I'm, I'm happy that we were able to our formal L our former L Increasement uh, that that's a that's a positive um, motion during some really difficult times. Remote learning. Mm -hmm. So thank you to the folks that were really putting it out there. And that's not easy. It's probably one of the most difficult things to do in education. Hats off to the educators and people who are in the trenches. Thank you, Member Cassianos. We got uh, Member Pena, Member Capola, Member Magnolia. Uh, just to echo on what Brian, you know, thank you, thank you, Superintendent. It was, it was hard to give us that presentation. That the reality is, this is what, this is where we at, you know. And then everyone was um, affected by the pandemic, you know. And uh, but there are still some positive things that we see there, you know. And I'm um, really grateful, you know, for those things. And uh, the whole thing is, we know where we're at. And like where we're moving, let's move forward. Man. You know, accountability is big, and and I I appreciate you know, you know us being here and, and you know being transparent about what's going on. And uh, but focus, you know, we have a plan, and let's move forward. You know, and we know where we're at, and you know we don't. There's no need to point fingers, and this is where we're all in this big you know puzzle together, and we need to um, do it for those kids, like you said, the kids of our our priority. Everyone who's an educator. Does this for the children, you know? And uh, sad, you know. The reality is, this is where we're at, and we got to move forward and make the plan. You know. Thank you for the presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Member Capola. Okay. Um, I know that it was very heartfelt on your part, Deb, and I know that you um, are as disappointed as we are, and I'm sure. Um, you know, the staff is the same. Mm -hmm. um, the teachers, you know, the rain was right. Um, we heard them loud and clear a year ago 
when they put it in the survey for us. And um, we should have started a year ago, you know, really dissecting it and um, and giving them more support than they have. But um, I don't know. it Now, in the Mass General Law, it talks about the MCAS, and it says each district in which more than 20% of the students score below level two on this. So, you know, we we have been in that before, and we're in it now. And my concern is um, they ask for a plan. You know, this, this strategic plan is good, but some of the things they ask for is a plan to assess each student's strengths, weaknesses, and needs, and then a plan for summer school, after school, and other additional support. And um, the other thing, which not, nothing is mentioned here about parents, but it's a plan for involving the parents of students as described in the subgraph. So m my thought is, you know, I mean, this is all good to just lay it out there, but a lot of this that's there is what teachers are stressing about. You know, all of the new curriculum that we we have put out, all of the programs, all of the all the stuff and not only that but um you know what have we added on like if we have to send a report and it's it states here that by, by november 1st this report should should have been in or in a, and it probably is in but um how do we address those things how do we you know when we talk about after school stuff for support for kids we're always saying we don't have enough of it we've you know we so if we're mandated to do it because we've reached the bottom, you know, what have we done since we saw these that we've added on? Do you want, it, in terms of the after school? Yeah, do you have? Um, we're making it a priority in our ESSA 3 funding, um, and it needs to be a priority in terms of what each school wants to design. Correspondence was sent out to each and every school asking them to think about what they wanted to do for not only for after school programming for vacation you know during vacations and also for summer school funding and each school is looking at what they would like to do to meet the needs of their own learning community and submitting a plan by November 28th okay. and I just want to add to that that um, historically even personal experience, whenever after school programming happened or summer school programming happened, it was always the general ed kids and the special ed kids. They were separate. And so we had a long conversation about that and that it can't be separate. Mm -hmm. it, it needs to be, every school needs to include mm -hmm. all their self-contained classrooms, all their inclusion students, like everyone should be part of it um, as a school. And now, obviously, there's challenges with that, transportation, right? But we need to do this. We need to do this for our students. So the schools are in the process of working through what, you know, working with their teachers. What do we want to offer? What is it going to entail? Who is, you know, putting it out there to the families to um, have people sign up? And so they're working on that now. The other thing I just want to note is that each individual school also digs into their own data with their teachers. So, and I'm sure Mr. Uh, Member Dugan knows that because you probably did that at your school. Yeah. Um, and what happens is each teacher gets data about their students, the ones they have in front of them, mm -hmm. and can see the item analysis, can see more detailed information about individual students, where they scored, what their growth percentile was, what standards did they struggle with. And then the teacher works with those students on filling those gaps. Um, and a lot of times the programming after school and in the summer and on vacation academies are all based on what teachers know about their students and what then that's how they develop what they're going to offer. Mm -hmm. So there is much more detail put into it mm -hmm. at the school level. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted you all to know that we are making sure it is inclusive. It's one of our mm -hmm. core values and yet it's always separate. Mm -hmm. It needs to be with. And that's not new though. That's, has that, how long has that gone on? 
how long has what gone? It, the, the studying in the... Oh, no, you know. no, that's not new. We've always looked at, at the school level, have always looked at item analysis. And, but here's the thing. With our equity work, one of the things that we have not been good about is, is looking at, in detail, really digging in to the subgroup data. We look at it in general, but when you look at, so one of the graphs that I showed you was uh, the percentage of students who meet and exceed. And I said, we need to dig into who are those kids. Mm -hmm. Are out. those all our white and Asian kids? <coughs> are any of them else? Mm -hmm. Right? And so we've got to, at, at every level, we have to go deeper into why are our African American um, black students and our Latino students not scoring as high as our white and Asian kids? Everyone Absolutely. should be mm -hmm. moving mm -hmm. at the same rate. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to how we instruct what resources we're using, are they appropriate for students who have a second language, are we valuing that they have something to bring to the table, because I'm going to tell you from personal experience, and I, I have sleepless nights sometimes when I think back, uh, being a principal and a teacher with L's, how many of my L's that I had at Harrington School that we did not serve well, because we were using assessments that really didn't meet their need, materials that didn't meet their need. Uh, we had many that, that moved and did well. We wouldn't have got out of level four status if we didn't. Mm -hmm. But there were kids who we didn't meet. And it was because we were not teaching or looking at them in a way that they could access what we were offering. And so that's a huge focus mm -hmm. for us now. We have 6,500 L's in our district. Yeah. We have to teach differently. In, and it has to be language acquisition based. These students have second languages. It's not easy because we've all been trained as monolingual teachers in a monolingual system. We don't work in a monolingual district. We just don't. It's not where we are. The other thing that it says to address in the plan is involving the parents of students. So Yeah, and, and I would say to that that um, teachers have conferences with parents all the time, after school, on, on the typical open houses. Um, what I personally would love to see us dig into is what our open houses look like mm -hmm. and how they're being used. Mm -hmm. It, you know, open house in the day of doing these fun events for people to come to is all well and good, but when we have scores like this, it needs to be more data driven. It needs to be more individual conferences with a schedule. It needs to be um, more, uh, here's some things you can do to help your child at home in these skills so that we can bring them up. Parents want to know, how can I help? Mm -hmm. we, need to ch we need to rethink and many schools have, but not all. Mm -hmm. And so I, we really, you know, with data like this, we need to look at those open houses differently. And have the parents seen their child's? So we get uh, state reports. Every child gets a report. Those already were sent out. The principals got them a, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and those have already been sent home. They get them in languages that they need. Um, and then uh, you, I know a question was asked about parents being notified of any teacher who is not licensed. Mm -hmm. That's an obligation of ours as well. Charlie Gallo does that, and he is in the process of doing that. Yep. Or has that already gone out? Yep. He's in the process. It's in the process. Mm -hmm. those, will, those letters will be going out soon. Okay, and um, some of the questions, I'm not, I'm not going to name them all, but one in particular is pupil-teacher uh, pupil ratios in class size, which is very concerning to me. Um, I can't go anywhere. I mean, I just went to the classical fundraiser at the Prince Spaghetti, a great meal, but teachers who are sitting in classrooms, and they're saying, I cannot get a child ready for biology they're testing this year with the number of kids i have in my class yeah. it, i mean it's everywhere we go 
it's a, a serious concern. I mean, we can't just keep saying, you know, we don't have room or something. We, we've got to get creative, you know, uh, in some other way. We, we just have to. I will say that in both high schools, we are putting another portable. So Classical will have a new six-room portable. And English is getting also a six-room portable that's being added to the portable that's out there. So it actually will be a 12-room uh, portable. So those are in motion and will be there for, I think, well, at least for September, maybe even in the spring. So that's a whole quick. lost year for the kids that are in those classes this year. That's, that's why we can't get out of the hole. We, we just can't. I know. We, the, these teachers are killing themselves working at this. And, and we have so many non-certified ones you know, that we've hired. I mean, we can't leave a class empty, but I, my concern is what do they, what are they getting? They really need to be, um, you know, held up. Yeah, the, the teacher uh, certification side of it, the licensure side of it, I have to say is a national issue. There's a teacher shortage. Um, it's, it's, well known now it's spoken about a lot uh, we try very hard to get licensed we're always looking for licensed people um, and even if we hire someone who's not licensed the schools are providing those teachers with additional support like from department heads or CITs or so that we're keeping you know building their skills um, but that's one of those things that to some extent is out of our control because there's not we're trying we, we believe me we we keep any job that's open is is out there for you know to to for someone to apply to um principals are i, I sign so many you know approved to hire um they're letting people go who they feel are not good we've 90 dayed more people than i ever remember because they just do not meet our standards um, so they're only, and we've had those conversations, only keep the people who you know are worthy and have the capacity mm -hmm. to do what we need them to yeah. do um, because we can't afford it for our no, kids. we cannot. Thank you. All right, I had member Magnolia and then member Pena. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, I know a lot of people have talked about we have been in the trenches and I, I just want to give the perspective of a parent who had a child in that Lynn public school system throughout the pandemic to say that um, that experience was traumatizing for me because I'm in a dual income house with two people who could work remotely and with a high level of education and still managing our child's remote learning was challenging and 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 quite stressful and and i found myself in the best possible scenario like the best my job was not under any kind of threat we had food we stayed healthy you know the absenteeism that you were talking about was not an issue when when the children went back um for fully in person, you know, we felt comfortable, masked, etc. going back, you know, had to shrink our pod as a result. So we were in the perfect scenario. And still this experience was traumatizing. And I'm using that word on purpose not to usurp Brian's uh, field of expertise here. But I don't want us to lose that word because you used one term when you were talking about um, the strategic plan going forth, and that is to foster a sense of belonging. Okay, one of the things I've noticed for last year, that was the first year back fully in person, but that I've seen this year already, is that the kind of conflict, and again, my child's in elementary school, so the number of kids getting detention for acting out um, at my daughter's class they were screaming at lunch right so anything from the fights that we've witnessed to just what i'd call general mayhem right all of that is a direct result of the trauma of the past couple years 
And while I understand that disciplinary procedures that principals enact are kind of boilerplate, I think that we cannot underestimate pushing these kids to learn more, to learn faster, to catch up without simultaneously addressing that level of trauma is going to re-traumatize them. So rather than seeing this gradual uptick, what we're going to see is that some kids will succeed because maybe they have the supports at home and other kids, that dropout rate, my guess is, is going to skyrocket if we cannot take that belonging, that soft factor, and amp it up. I know the things that were successful for the kids that were acting out last year were teachers that were highly caring, that had good relationships with parents. You can't just make that happen though, right? So the question is how can schools, how can individual classrooms, but also how can principals look at this concept of belonging and adjust how they approach discipline, how they approach communication, so that parents who are in perfect situations and were traumatized, and I know 90% of Lynn Public School students did not have parents in perfect situations, can feel like they are connected to the schools in such a way that they can be partners in this concept of belonging. Because if we tracked those numbers with discipline issues, we would see a correlation. If we tracked them with how many parents lost employment during the pandemic, if we could do the individual aggregation, we would, we would be able to see exactly how that's playing out and who's bouncing back Again, we'd have our why. So I, I, I don't think it's so much a question as saying that trauma-informed practice approaches this kind of need <coughs> to push all the academics in a very specific way. And I know we have a brand new director of social and emotional learning, and I'm sure I'm like speaking to her perfect language in saying this. But I have witnessed this on the playground. I have witnessed this in the kids at birthday parties. I have witnessed this in, oh, so-and-so got detention today or suspension today. I've heard more stories like that since the pandemic, since they went back, than I ever did before. And so I think that this soft skill, the stuff that Massachusetts general law does not require, is going to be the key to our success. I just want to uh, thank you for that because um, e what you said is 100% accurate. Uh, I will say that we've already started having conversations around how we can support the schools, our teachers, um, our parents. Um, we've, uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, Tina, the de-escalation training that uh, was developed by the clinicians, 2018. Um, we are resurrecting that. Um, the clini clinical uh, staff uh, under the leadership of Tina are looking at that to present to teachers to get, I mean, we've got a lot of new people who never did it. Um, and so that they have a skill set of how they can help children de-escalate their, their emotions, their feelings, their you know, lack of coping. We've also talked about pa you know, helping parents by sharing information like that. Um, we've had conversations about needing like a swing space in schools so that you're not just suspending a kid or expelling a kid, that there is a place that we can have that student go, get support, get some um, uh, counseling or uh, restorative work with them to then reintegrate back. Because quite honestly, FECTO can't be the only place, right? Ooh. And FECTO has certain uh, parameters for students to go there. And, you know, we can't just keep sending kids out. Uh, and I know in the hearings that I've sat in, I start every meeting with, we have an obligation to educate you. And I want you to be successful. 
um, and, uh, but some of the behaviors are extreme. Um, but we need to, as a district, figure out how we can get them the help they need within Lynn Public Schools and then reintegrate. So thank you for bringing that up. Tiffany, if I may, also in our approach to the curriculum, um, Tina and I are having multiple conversations and with her team also about not making SEL a standalone. Mm. You know, SEL competencies and SEL curricula needs to be in all of our content areas. Mm -hmm. And that really needs to be our approach moving forward so that it's throughout the school day, through it's so it's throughout every single curriculum. And that is how we're going to approach it in terms of a curricula. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Magnolia is looking at my notes, but. <laughs> I was going to touch upon that and just a second um, what Donna was talking about engaging parents and stuff like one of the things I like to see is like look, like getting parents involved right but kind of look bringing them as a partnership into this and and, and reaching out in different languages you know because I know a lot of many parents who don't speak English that reach out to me they want to get involved but we need to we need to share that information we need to have forums we have community input for a whole bunch of things how about for getting our kids up to date with, with our school work MCAS scores like let's have for let's 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 bring them in let's get let's get input from the Latino community other uh, other language that don't speak English you know get the parents involved it's hard when at home they don't speak the language but the student you know because I, I, that's that's how I, that's how I grew up like I spoke English but my my parents at home did it you know and uh, it, it's a tough to and parents do want to get involved but we need to reach out to them and not in in a, in a form to like get them engaged like you bring them in a partnership let's see which what can you bring how, how can we all work work with this together because it's a problem that affected everyone you know like Dr. Magnolia said everyone's you know had the trauma you know and and then we need to get back and, and one of those ways is like let's get the families involved you know and let, let's 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 reach out and, and send you know bullet points you know reach out in, in different languages you know so I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you you've talked about that but let's let's get with it you know it's, it's time we you know we need to move forward with this thank you well thanks everybody. I just want to thank um Superintendent Ruggiero for the for the presentation uh, and and all the the school committee members for their the the, the questions and, and comments. Obviously, uh, I think we we all want to turn this around. Right? And and it's uh, one of the things I think is particularly frustrating is looking at some of these graphs that go back several years and seeing some of the painstaking progress we had made before the pandemic. You know, you look at that uh, absentee rate that was flat for years and years and just starting to bend as you know we had made that a goal of the district and then for it to, to blow up like that and 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 that that's frustrating and and i I'm, I'm so glad that this whole team is as motivated as they are to address that i i also just want to take a minute um to to reflect on you know a, a theme that member magnolia touched on is that while we are using these scores as a tool to set a baseline we obviously look at what happened in 2022 and know that that wasn't just what happened in 2022. That was a cumulative effect of a once in a hundred year pandemic. And the learning is our top priority here. During that period, we were also dealing with hundreds of people passing away from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We were dealing with family members who were sicker than they ever been, sicker for, some that became sick for weeks and months that couldn't get in the care that they needed. Uh, essential workers that were risking their safety and sometimes livelihood to keep their family safe uh, day in and day out in an incredibly hectic and scary time that hit our community harder than anyone around the Commonwealth. And this is no surprise that we are now left to pick up the pieces, and we will, because that's our job. Uh, and I am excited that we are coming to this conversation with a lot of great ideas and questions about how to do that. We're coming to the conversation with a great 
team of folks that are that are doing that obviously the administrators here and and most importantly our faculty and staff that, that do this every day uh, in 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 the classrooms with students directly one-on-one -on -one. Uh, and you know I, I think it's also striking it needs to be part of the conversation we're having that in the course of these several years that we're thinking about the demographics of the district is are being is being transformed before our eyes in in adding to the work that we all have to do together to make sure that people achieve the language fluency that we know they they they, they need to uh succeed and uh it's, it's a huge task that we have before us to address that trauma to uh, continue to work with this uh really uh, important population. It's one of the things that I love most about the Lynn Public Schools is that we embrace that responsibility uh, for students that are coming from all over the world. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it has changed in the last several years in terms of uh, what that, 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 that ask is. And so I think it's really important, you talk about the accountability system, that when we are having those conversations at the state level about accountability, we are also including the impact that we had to deal with in Lynn and the student population that we have in Lynn. And some of the, the, the point that Member Coppola made about the, the, the need for classroom space, I think we've made some great progress there and things like adding the Discovery Academy and adding their early college uh, and, and doing some of the, the, the portable classrooms. We're doing everything we possibly can think of here in the Lynn Public Schools, but we are also tasked with educating uh, students in overflowing classrooms because we take everybody. And we have to, and we're really proud of that. Uh, but when we talk about the, the accountability, uh, I think we are uh, obviously very grateful beneficiaries of the investment we've received through the Student Opportunity Act and have made incredible strides in putting that money to great work. Uh, and I think we saw some of that in the, in the, in the strategies going forward. Uh, but we, we, we really also need to be continuing to put front and center uh, in the context of, of, of how we're doing um, though the, the the reform that's need on needed on the capital side of how education works in our in our school buildings and the need for more classrooms so i just wanted to uh, to add that context thank you ma'am member castellanos uh, so we have uh so the the castle the area what we what, for sel we have a a, a significant model that we were presented with during um, the SEL interviews. I, I feel like everyone on the school committee should be mailed. Well, we should email. Could we email that to everybody just so folks have that that background as, as it is a, a key action item? I think it would be good to have that that background information because it is something that drives our district. It's been driving. It's like it's not just a buzzword. It is a lot that goes into it. And I think it would be helpful just to <coughs> have the members take a look at what that is. Thank you. Yeah. Next section is communications and information. Uh, before we dive into the superintendent report, I just, uh, at the uh, behest of our search uh, consultant from MASC, Mr. Kucher, wanted to share an update on the search. So we are uh, close to winding up interviews with the search committee, the screening committee, uh, and we, Mr. Kucher, will be sharing the interview guide that was. Uh, uh, used by this search committee with with all of the school committee uh, and that will uh, kick off the, the process that that is with the school committee to figure out how uh, we would like to conduct the finalist interviews in terms of which questions to ask and how to uh, sort that out I think in the past you know we tried to do some coordination so that uh, we know we're not planning to ask the same question um, and, and Mr. Kucher can guide us through that process so uh, not only are we Paired, but we also uh, uh, correctly navigate the various open meeting um, considerations that go along with that. Okay. All right. Um, well, I always start with a quote, right? <laughs> so here we go. Um, the elevator to success is out of o is out of order. You'll have to use the stairs one step at a time. Mm -hmm. By Joe Giard. This week has been very hard for many reasons. What is clear, however, is how our community at large and our community of educators wrap their arms around the need. Whether it's wrapping our arms around families who have had great loss, supporting our staff through a difficult rollout of many new resources, and after reviewing our MCAS data, recognizing the urgency of our response to support our students in recovering from the loss of learning. This impact is profound, 
and our collective distress is real. As I said in my presentation, we must remember that every bar that we look at, every chart we analyze, is a student who needs us. This is not going to be easy work, and it will not happen quickly, but we must move forward and wrap our arms around our students and help them move forward in their education. Just a few updates. We will be conducting the Youth Risk Behavior Survey to all middle school and high school students to provide us with data to fully understand where the most need is in their health and social emotional well-being. Our monthly, monthly newsletter continues to go out to our school leaders, which I gave you a copy of so you could see, uh, with plans to expand this to all staff so that everyone is kept up to date on current events. And the Pickering Building Project has entered our visioning workshop and education <coughs> plan development stage. We held our first of three visioning workshops last night with family members from feeder schools as well as the existing middle school, community members, teachers, and district leaders. The meeting was facilitated by New Vista Design to develop educational, architectural, and community priorities. We began collecting input around the vision for the learning goals of the new Pickering Middle School and what that will look like through the design of the building. The other two visioning sessions are scheduled for November 16th and December 7th from eight, uh, 6 to 8, and a community meeting will be held on November 30th to share the ideas from the first two meetings and to get feedback from other community members who are interested in participating in this process. This is uh, exciting work, and I look forward to the, process, uh, the progress to come. Uh, information about that community meeting will be sent out um, so that uh, those who are interested can, can access it. In closing, I want to ensure the entire school committee and the community at large that the Lynn Public School staff are all committed to doing what needs to get done to move our students in a positive direction. Learning is hard and together we can achieve. Juntos logramos. Thank you. Motion so no to adjourn. Before it's seconded. Second. Sorry. Member Cassianos. Uh, would it be possible to receive a, a, a copy of that use, the youth risk behavior survey? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. can we get a copy? For of yeah, I'm pretty sure we can get a copy Could of it. Oh, we do. Yeah. Okay. We can, yes, we, we can forward. get that too. Thank you. There's a motion on the table. Any second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
my TV Weather says it's gonna rain all week Get in my car and I get off to work And everybody on the road is a flaming freaking jerk Get cut off twice by an SUV swerving in my lane I get a clip fender and a dirty look And other strangers hate it, I can't explain I'm so hard to deal with Why does everybody want to mess with me? I'm the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet Still everyone's offended every time I... Over 600 responses uh, in, in sort of number of stakeholder meetings uh, to help further develop that. Um, this summer, uh, we participated um, in uh, Linside Out, which was a public engagement event in partnership with the mayor's office to essentially do just that, provide access to city hall departments downtown uh, around uh, the Frederick Douglass Park and Mount Vernon Street as an opportunity to engage the community more generally about um, services that are available, ongoing projects and programs that a number of city departments uh, are advancing, uh, but gave us an opportunity to sort of, sort of piggyback on that um, and engage the community. And we received over 175 responses um, at, at, that, at that table. It turned out to be, I think, a very uh, productive uh, event. Over 750 people showed up that day. Um, it also gave, gave an opportunity to kind of showcase the arts and cultural acti activities and attractions in the city. Um, so there's a lot of work that went into developing that, that vision statement. <coughs> um, I won't go into much detail around sort of a reminder around the comprehensive plan, but essentially the next step is to take uh, the vision mm. statement and start kind of making the connection between that ap aspirational goal into specific actions and strategies. And I just want to kind of hit some examples of how that plays out and will play out. Uh, again, working with you and the community and other departments to sort of hone in on what are the actions that come out of this. So just don't expect anybody to remember this. I will share the slide deck. Um, but the vision statement is as follows. Uh, Lynn will be a city where people feel safe and comfortable to live, work, learn, and play. Lynn will be a city where all community members have the housing, transportation access, social connections, and educational or economic opportunities to live a fulfilling life. And then we'll be a city to be proud of with strong, diverse, and connected communities that take care of shared spaces, natural resources, and each other. So that's an aspirational goal for the, city, for the city to be. It's a vision that looks out 25 years. Some of those things are already in place. Some of those things may be strengthened. Some, some of them may be new. Um, but it, that basically sets the stage for how do we, you know, how, how do we achieve that goal in the 25-year in the time frame. Um, and we're, we're framing this plan, 